Are you ready to rumble? This isn't working. I'll just yell. All right, so greetings, everybody. Uh, my name is Bill Ouellette. I'm the managing director of the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. And I know you've gone to a lot of intellectual things today. This is diversity. We have these things. <laughs> but uh, we're gonna have, a, we should have a lot of fun here, but it's also pretty serious stuff about entrepreneurship. But before I start, I just wanna, what, uh, how many of you are MBAs here? How many of you are, are that Sloan Fellows? Embas? Uh, what, do we, what else do we have? LGO? All right. What's that? Ah, Masters of Finance. They seem to. <laughs> what else? SC, what? SM. And, uh, what else am I missing? PhDs? <laughs> How about Harvard Business School, here to steal the ideas? No, nothing but love, Kathy, nothing but love. All right, so we're gonna have some fun here. We have people from your classes back to, back to uh, present here, and uh, hopefully you'll support them. We call this Beaver Tank because um, Shark Tank is not is not nice, it's not educational, it's just, and what we're gonna do here today is going to be nice, it's gonna be supportive, and hopefully we're gonna take entrepreneurs and they're gonna be better when they leave here because they're gonna get your support, and we have tools to do that. Um, before I start, just a commercial for the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. For those of you who don't know, we have an annual report. If you want one of these things, just talk to anyone from the um, OER, or come up here and pick up one of the five, or you can just go online to entrepreneurship.mit.edu. I can guarantee you whatever it was like when you were here, it's much different now. Um, just, we just did a presentation, which we were invited, it was very nice, by the uh, executive committee at Sloan, and now we're not just focused only on startups. Yes, we have had a terrific record with startups. You heard from Freddie Karras here, um, you, you know, Elliot Cohen's success story, but we're equally proud of the dozens of other people out there who have, who have not just started companies, but done things inside companies. And so now we talk about how entrepreneurship is much, much greater than just startups. We're not just about founders. We're trying to create people who are entrepreneurial. And that's, that mindset, that skill set, that way of doing business is something that is needed throughout the entire levels of society from startups through to government, to academics, to large corporations, to nonprofits. So um, you'll, you'll, for those of you who are looking at what we do, you'll see a lot more of that. We had three incredibly popular courses this year. Um, that one was entrepreneurial sales, which has always been, was led by Kirk Arnold and uh, Lou Shipley. Um, and they are a terrific team. And what we do is we get um, diversity in, in, our, in what we teach. And Kirk Arnold is a leading uh, female executive in the Boston area, and it's, we're so glad to have her. We also had a very uh, successful class in entrepreneurial founding and teams taught by Kit Hickey, the founder of Ministry of Supply, and Aaron Scott. Um, it got the highest ratings, and I think, we, I haven't seen the ratings yet for the other one called Scaling Entrepreneurial Ventures. Um, but that was taught by uh, Brian Halligan, who was founder of HubSpot, came out of here, started his class here, Elliot Cohen, who started PillPack here, and they taught the students with the rigor and the relevance um, that we expect at MIT, not just storytelling, but what are the skills that you need to be to be uh, entrepreneurial, whether you're in a startup, whether you're in a big organization or not. So we're super proud of that. So what we're gonna do today is we're going to do a, uh, we're gonna have 10 teams, is it 10? 12, 12. We're gonna have 12 teams that are gonna present and you're gonna give feedback on it when they do it. And there's gonna be a, a system made that by one of our former students who's up, Jeff Vadunia, classmates of Jeff Vadunia here. So um, his company is called Poll Everywhere and Jeff's gonna give us, explain to you 
what the company does and how it's going to be involved here. So can we run the video? Thanks, Bill. Sloanies, welcome back to campus. I wish I could be with you this year, but I know this event is going to be a lot of fun. Although I graduated in 2010, I'll always be 09 at heart. I co-founded Poll Everywhere during Sloan from the belief that presenting would be more authentic as a two-way experience. And since then, we've grown to over 60 people, and last year we made the Inc. 5000. We've done this on $20,000 of funding and a lot of good lessons from OP. So in the words of Howard Anderson, Poll Ev is a solid B+. The platform is super easy to use, so let's do it now. You can either text or use the web. On the web, visit polev.com slash MIT Sloan. If you're texting, text the word MIT Sloan to the phone number 22333. Capitalization doesn't matter, but notice that there's no space between the words MIT and Sloan. Okay, everybody got that? With that, you're all set and ready to go. Bill and his team will show the questions now, and you're all ready to have some fun. Thanks, guys. I miss you, and have a great reunion. But what we're going to do is we want all of you to pull, uh, pull out your phones and go to pollev.com. Or the text. Or the text. OK, we usually do it over there. You already tried it? All right, good. All right, we got it? The first one is going to be, um, we'd like you to get a sense of who's in the room, use your phone and tell us if you're an entrepreneur, a VC, a Sloney, or what, whatever the other option is there, all right? And then it will show us in real time who's in the room. Okay, that was warm up, all right? Now let's, now let's switch to the second question, which is gonna be more fun. That was, that was meant to be the warm up. Um, the next one is, we'd like you to put in the names of companies that you have started or invested in. Um, or if you know a friend or a classmate who, who has a company, just put the name in there, and then we're gonna see a name cloud of all these different companies coming up there. Can we switch to the next one? Alba, a lot of love for Alba here. Okta, so I guess that means Alba's market cap is higher than Okta's. Lumen, Airworks. Look at Gattaca, Cover Wallet, Rashmi, did you pop, put that in there? Deep Bench, EcoVent, EcoVent, <laughs> Dropbox, Pluto, Air. These are companies what? Amazon, Enron, nice. <laughs> Red score. <laughs> Ministry. Look at this. Oh, Lumen, man. Akamai. That's good. So, this we didn't know what was going to happen here, but um, I think what's really, what's really interesting here is we really have a deep legacy of creating new companies and helping companies that are just getting going to become sig very cool. significant and successful companies. And you can see that up here. Uh, it's not just one company, there's lots of them from people in this room. So we went back to the other one there. All right, so maybe when we're done, DataZoo, we, we'll, we'll show that one or put that one up so you can see it. All right, so now let's get into the, the, the most fun part. That is to hear from the entrepreneurs themselves. We have two fantastic uh, judges here, nice judges, who are going to be constructive <laughs> and kind. It's water, not sky. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's start with Dip Patel. Dip, Dip please Hi, introduce everyone. yourself. Hey, everyone. I was uh, MBA 14. I came to Sloan to, uh, yeah, right on. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best class. They make chips. <laughs> to feed judges. <laughs> no. Anyway, I started a company while I was here called EcoVent. Had to sell that in uh, 2017. And now, we're actually inventing a new kind of data center that is variable consumption. 
And uh, basically, that is a new business model. And to use that as a business model for green energy. So the idea is that if you have a green energy plant that you can't make profitable, you can now hook up a data center that can effectively use the extra energy to make it profitable, thus allowing just about any large green energy plant to become uh, viable. Oh, it's called Saluna. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> and secondly, from the class of 2003, man, you oh, look yeah. much younger yeah, yeah. than that. <laughs> Uh, Rashmi, Rashmi Mal Malgari is uh, at Cover Wallet now. Introduce yeah, yourself, thanks. Rashmi. Yeah, I was MIT undergraduate 2003 um, and MIT MBA Sloan 2009. Yeah, right. um, and uh, I started a company four years ago with someone uh, that I met in my MBA, um, and the company's called Cover Wallet, and we're an online platform for uh, entrepreneurs and business people to buy insurance online. So. Just a quick plug about that. If any of you are about to start a company and then you find out you have to get insurance, you're going to go to this awful world of offline neighborhood brokers and deal with PDFs and fax machines. Um, and having been through that before, my co-founder and I thought there was a better way to deal with that whole industry. And so we've actually developed the first online platform, um, much like what happened in the travel industry, where you can actually go online, give a couple pieces of information, and get competitive quotes all there online. Um, and that's called Cover Vault. And I'm, Super happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Bill. So, thank you. <laughs> we go with you. And I also want to say that, um, you know, these two have been incredibly helpful to us at the Trust Center. Dip actually did a stint as an EIR there, and has helped out so many students. I, I was just joking with them before. The students, I said, I just spoke to Dip. I just spoke to Dip. It's <laughs> like, how can you be in all these places at one time? Um, it's two it's, of us. <laughs> And then one of the big initiatives we had, with, which Rashmi and Anaki were very helpful on, I remember going to the restaurant and saying, we got to get something going in New York. And for those of you who don't know, we now have a New York summer startup studio where we have 17 teams over the summer here, and we have seven in New York. And it's fantastic because um, not only did the students up here get to go to New York, but New York and the New York students in New York get to come here. It increases our bandwidth. Um, for the students, it's just terrific because to get the experience to be in New York, the clock speed in New York is much, much faster than it is in Boston. It's a fundamentally different culture. There's a great book called The Island at the Center of the Earth. And it's a more of a Dutch culture down here where it's more of an English culture up here. And I won't get into all the subtleties of that, but there are differences. And when you go down to New York, they, they get a different perspective on the world. And it can be, sometimes we just get in the car here and within three hours or less, three, not less, three, <laughs> three or four hours, we're from here to New York and uh, the teams can go back and forth and there's a whole bunch of alumni. Any alumni here from New York who've been involved with the New York Startup Studio? Well, you should, you, you, we should get you involved. It's, uh, it's a great thing. Um, and what we do, this is called the Delta V program, where the teams at the, end, at the end of the year who really want to focus on theirs and spend full time on it, a full immersion program, they apply and they get accepted into a program called Delta V, which is we're losing people to Y Combinator and Techstars. And so what we did is we created the Y Combinator Techstars at, at MIT, except it's better. Um, and some of the teams you're going to hear today came out of that. And they get $2,000 per student per month and they commit to work full time on it and they get $20,000 in um, potential milestone payments over the course of the summer if they hit certain milestones. They get a board of directors for the summer and they get a lot of support to kind of push them forward. And um, it's been a really, really big shot in the arm for uh, us. And being able to do it in New York allows us to get seven more teams and get better experience. So thank you very much, Rashmi. Um, and thank, thank you to Anaki, who can't be here, as he travels the world That's right. promoting <laughs> entrepreneurship. All right, so are we ready to go with our teams? All right. All right Aline. Ready, Aline? Here we go. The first one, Aleem Ahmed, is MBA from 2014 here for his fifth reunion. He's the founder and CEO of Wildcore. Go get him, Aleem. Hi, my name is Aleem, and I'm wild for teff. <laughs> teff is an ancient Ethiopian grain that the secret source of, of, of lasting energy for Ethiopia's elite marathon runners. But first, I want you to meet Maya. 
She's a busy working mom who's always on the go and barely has time to eat. When she does, she normally is reaching for a protein bar that actually has more sugar than protein. Like Maya, we all want to be healthy when we're on the go. We just lack the nourishing options to get us through our busy days. But the solution to this problem has been around for thousands of years. It's an ancient Ethiopian grain called teff. It's packed with vitamins, fiber, and protein. It's all naturally gluten-free. It's used to make the country's flatbread, injera, and when it's not fermented, it has a mild nutty flavor. Ethiopian runners cite teff as the source of their secret lasting energy. I learned about teff when I worked for the Ethiopian Ministry of Agriculture, helping some of the country's six million teff farmers increase their yields. I realized that there could be a huge market for teff in the US if it was put into food products that Americans were familiar with. Teff is gonna be the next quinoa. <laughs> this chart shows the rise of quinoa imports into the US since 2005. Teff is exactly where quinoa was 14 years ago. More importantly, market experts are hailing Teff as the holy grail of nutrition. So to capture a significant share of the $20 billion salty snack market, I developed a line of Teff chips with a highly differentiated value proposition. They have twice the protein and half the fat of their competitors. One handful of Teff chips has as much protein as an egg. But we're not just an idea, I have sales traction. We launched at Whole Foods New York in January, and the product is flying off the shelves. We're acquiring customers through demos, displays, and discounts, and we just doubled our weekly sales velocity in the last quarter. With retailers like Walmart and Target clamoring to get a hold of the product, I'm looking to raise a million dollars. Moreover, I'm looking for connections to retailers like Wegmans and Publix, and also eager to connect with CPG food experts for mentorship. I'm Aleem from Wild for Teff Chips, and I'm inviting you to come to our table after the event and sample and buy the hottest selling snack out of Whole Foods New York. Good job. Way to get us off to a good start. Do we get doing your questions? All right. Please put in if you can help Aleem. He will get a, a PDF of the file afterwards. So if you can help him, please go in there, put your name in, your email, your um, your credit card number, and your PIN, <laughs> and we'll get back to you. No, but please do. Anything you can do to help. He had a very clear ask at the end there. So anything you can do to help. Okay. How are you likely to invest? Damn likely. Keep gnawing on it. Dead wood. <laughs> oh, man. It only, it only takes one. It only takes one in that damn likely. That's true. All right. Needs a line over By the way, you know, I'm glad to say that everyone's a winner here at the Beaver Tank, but we're going to have one winner that Brad Peterson has agreed will we'll be able to go public on NASDAQ for free <laughs> right after that. <laughs> That's a liberal interpretation, right? Let's not start spreading fake news here. <laughs> All right. Dip. Yes. Ra Rashmi, what do you have to say? First, I have to say, where do you go? Right there. Yeah, First of all, congratulations. That's amazing. I mean, just to have traction and to be up and running and to have sales in an incredibly uh, hard space like retail and to have shelf space. Um, I don't actually have anything critical to say. I just like, want to learn more about yeah, it. Yeah, they're good. Like, uh, <laughs> now I've known Aleem for a while. We had, uh, he had pancake batter back in the day, and uh, they were good. <laughs> but as he said, they buy, people buy them once a year. So um, my question would be, I saw the sales, and that's good. But what does your margin look like? You know, how much money do you actually make? Yeah. And the million you're seeking, how does that uh, make you worth like five or six X what you are now? If you can answer those questions, then uh, you'll get my, uh, I don't know, clap. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're seeking uh, industry-wide gross margins at scale, which will be at 300 doors of 50% gross margins. 
Um, and that million dollars will get us to a $5 million revenue run rate. Um, and in this industry, you see a three to five X multiple on that. So a 15 um, plus million dollar valuation um, going forward. All right, man, nice. All right. Aline, what are, the, what are the questions that I'm sure people are going to say is, how much have you raised so far? Yeah, we've raised uh, 400000 in convertible debt so far. Uh-huh. And we've used that to develop the product, cultivate the brand, and bring it to market in New York. Um, demonstrate proof of concept and product market fit. Beautiful. And a de proud Delta V. Were you in the first class? Uh, yeah. And it was known as Love Grain. It was known as Love Grain. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you. I don't eat chips often, but when I do, I eat wild for tough chips. All right, next up, MBA class of 1999. Can you raise your game and, and to the same level as Aleem? That's the question. Daniel, blow us away. Thank you. And thank you to my 1999 brothers and sisters for sticking around to support me. I want to talk to you about a business, a function that needs to be reinvented. It might not even seem like a function, but sustainability work. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, it means things like setting targets. It means things like making the business case or tracking progress. And it turns out, to get the basics out of the way first, it turns out that's about a billion dollars a year in consulting spend and another billion or so in staff spend. And the staff spend is growing. The problem is we're stuck in the old days. And it needs to be reinvented by tools in the same way that Microsoft Office revolutionized IBM Selectrix for those of you who are not from the 1999 class, you might not know what that is. <laughs> but in the same way, Microsoft Office revolutionized that. Now, that's the basics. You can see a little bit. The pricing is 15000 per tool. It's a SaaS license. There's a volume discount. You can see a little bit about me. We've actually licensed the tools to some companies. All right, so that's the basics. But the question then is, why care? And the reason is, that this is something that people do all the time. And the world is literally on fire. And they don't do this very much. It takes too long. It costs too much. If you can make it take 1 20th as much time, if you can make it dramatically less expensive, people will do more to save the world. People will do more to, say, set a science-based carbon target, which is a reduction of, say, 80% off their current baseline emissions. We need that. And people don't do it for the same reason that you don't respond to every invitation to do a survey that you get from some shopping experience. If it's too hard, if it takes too long, if it costs too much. And in addition, if you can't make the business case, these tools enable people to do that, to find literally 20 times as much business value as they thought, to do it in 1 20th the time. These are a couple of screens, a couple of examples, one for the science-based carbon target tool and one for the materiality tool. We have real customers. We have real revenue. We need technical talent. We need connections to distributors, consultants, and so forth, and to customers. Thanks. Well done, Daniel. All right, so let's help Daniel out here. This is fantastic. Thank you, Daniel. This is what we need. We at MIT do not believe this is a Chinese hoax, all right, just to be clear. <laughs> Rashmi? Yeah, well, I just have a question. Can you talk about some of the projects that you've done and the impact that you've had? Yeah, for example, right across, right around here, Novartis set their very, very aggressive climate, water, and waste targets. And they used our tools to do that. Instead of taking, it typically takes a month or two to set a science-based climate target, sometimes longer. It takes about two hours to set it with the tool. And because you can visualize it like you see on the screen, 
we were able to show it to executives, get buy-in, and so forth in a matter of days. I've also found nine figures in sustainability value by building a model like one of the tools for Johnson & Johnson. And I've done a bunch of work for quite a few other companies when Biogen just did their updated materiality. They're number one on the Dow Jones Sustainability Index for their industry. They use the tool that you see on the screen there for materiality. Thank you. Nice job, thanks man. Um, my question is, a couple questions. One is, you said you needed technical talent. What yeah. specifically, uh, what type of technical talent are you looking for? And then, um, I always know people need customers, so if you had an ideal customer persona almost, what would that look like? And then how do you make money? So I see how they kind of save a lot of money in time, but how does that make you more and more money, I guess, going forward? Okay, the short version is that although I went to school here, I'm not an engineer, I'm an engineer groupie, and therefore when I make a tool, it works kind of, but underneath is bailing wire and duct tape. What I need is technical talent that doesn't require bailing wire and duct tape. That means back-end, database, architecture, web, you know, connections into ER, ERP systems, enterprise resource planning systems, and so on. The second question is, you, the third one was how do you make money? Was the second question? Ideal customer. Ideal customer. There are two kinds of customers. The ideal customer is someone who works for a service provider. Because, look, the way that we can be catalysts in this world is not by doing all of this ourselves. It's, that's not the Microsoft Office model, right? We make the software and someone else uses it with their clients. Someone else uses it with their vendors, their customers, with the members of their organization. That's the ideal customer. We'll also definitely take individual companies like Novartis and Biogen and so forth because that's a great way to learn and to get it out there. And as far as making money, at 15,000 per year per company, or 25,000 for three, because we want to get people to use more and therefore it's stickier and so forth. There's a good margin here once you get, once you've amortized the development. There's a very good margin here once you've done that. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Daniel, just two other quick questions. Where are you located? New York City. New York City? Yep. And, um, <laughs> What was the other one? Um, where were you located? How much have you raised so far? No raises yet. So nope. far, all okay. funded out of revenue. We plan to raise Fantastic. in a couple yeah. of months. Well done. That kind of stuff, it makes us so proud to see that kind of. Are you a B Corp or are you straight up corporation? Straight up. Straight up, okay. John Sturman must love you. John Sturman. Yeah. And if, you, you, if, if you took S Lab or anything like that in the last, say, 10 or 15 years, you used earlier versions of the tools that I donated to the university. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, Daniel. Up now, from the class of 2009, Andreas Blank. Andreas? That's your boy. That's your boy. That's my boy. That's double tapping. Right? Hi, everybody. Um, Hey everybody, I'm really excited to be with all of you, so many MIT, uh, MIT alumni here, and also my co-founder, who's also a Sloney, Genevieve is here in the house. <laughs> so it's great to have another co-founder here. And my wife, Sarah, who I met here too. <laughs> all right. So I'm really excited to tell you about Fetcher and what we've been doing for the last two and a half years. So as many of you know, um, it, this is like the most heated job market we've ever seen in our lifetime. And what's happening is that the best people are just not gonna apply to your job posts. Like, people are right now being flooded with opportunities. And what we've realized is that actually, the best people are already employed, but are open to new opportunities. And the biggest problem is that attracting this talent, which we call passive talent, which is the people who are open to new opportunities, but they're not looking, is super time consuming. And the reason for that is that it's a numbers game. You literally have to spend more than 40% of your time as a recruiter and send over 200 emails for each job post to get to a hire. So what's happening, and this is what I experienced firsthand in my previous startup, is that even recruiters don't have time to do this. 
So we've been thinking a lot about how can we solve this since this is a problem that's just getting worse and worse over time. So Fetcher is the first company that is able to completely automate this for other companies. And the secret of how we're able to do this is that we use a lot of technology to automate that search, but there's also what we call a human in the loop that is looking at the data and training the algorithms to make sure that the, that the results are really better than even searching on LinkedIn yourself. So if you could look at it on the left side, this is kind of like what the life of a recruiter looked before Fetcher. They were like spending a ton of time, mostly on LinkedIn, doing a lot of research, and then doing a lot of tedious tasks, like sending a lot of messages, and then they have to remember, oh, I have to follow up to this person next week. And what's really awesome about Fetcher is that we can completely streamline this process for you. So now the life of a recruiter now looks more like on the, on the right side, which is pretty much just focused on talking to really relevant people. And this actually, in turn, makes that the candidate experience much better than what people are living now, because recruiters are so stretched with time that they actually can't spend enough time interviewing candidates and being very thoughtful about this process. So what's really exciting about Fetcher is that we are seeing tremendous results. And as a person who has started multiple companies, this has been, for me, just so thrilling to see because the product market fit is something that we saw from the first day that we launched this. So we've been around for two and a half years. We're already working with over 450 companies. Here are some of the companies that we're working with that we're super proud of. And as you can see, they're very diverse. So it doesn't matter if you're in tech, it doesn't matter if you're in manufacturing, like we are able to help you. And the other thing that's really important is that we're very capital efficient. We've been able to raise funding from leading investors from the East Coast and the West Coast, but we have half of the money still in the bank, and we have over 200 employees worldwide. So, um, and it's not only that we're getting a lot of traction, it's also that the customers actually really like it. And, we're, and, and the reason of why we're liking it is because we are saving them real time and real, and, and real money. Like we're saving them, like for a company like Citibank, they're able to hire for diverse talent and spend less than $1,000 for these type of hires. So this is Fetcher, and if you're really interested in trying to improve hiring inside your company, please go to fetcher.ai and check us out. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Adam, man. Wow. Yeah. What do you say about that, Dip? Can I get a can I get a, a Sloney coupon code? For a <laughs> nice job. Uh, I would say I mean you've got a ton of traction. Uh, I honestly don't even know how to give you good feedback other than how we, how can you double your your base? Like what? How can the room, people in the room here? Uh, help you double your, your sales next year? Yeah, it's a great question. And what we've come to realize is that, like, what is happening to our market is that there's a lot of uh, people in the space. So what my really talented co-founder, Jen, is doing is really helping build a really compelling story because what we've seen is that we're kind of creating a new category. Like, traditionally, recruiters are doing a lot of sourcing. That's what, what, we, what finding talent uh, passively is called. And we believe that this is the end of sourcing, that we believe that this is more like a new category. So we're working a lot on creating a story that's very compelling. And then the other side about how can you help, you know, just go to fetcher.ai and refer, if you're not doing recruiting in your companies, just tell the people who are managing recruiting in your companies and we'd love to chat and see if we can be of any help. Nice. And I happen to notice that Cover Wallet wasn't listed as one of the companies you're proud oh. to work with. Uh -oh. Did you want to talk uh -oh. about that a little bit? <laughs> I, did, I did it on purpose. <laughs> It was actually like one of my tricks to get Rashmi to admit that they're like one of our happy clients, although they're hiring like very, very rapidly. Yeah. Big fan. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Andreas, how many companies have you done now? How many companies have you done now? So in the US, this is my second company. My first company was with Iñaki. It was called Pixable, and we sold it in 2012, and this is yeah. my second company. So it's like the, it's the third time around. And what's really interesting <laughs> is, you know, in entrepreneurship, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And, you know, when we're looking at, you know, um, we love all our entrepreneurs, but Okta is just crushing it. And one of the reasons they're crushing it is kind of what Andreas is here. They get the product market fit nailed. And then all it is is just yeah. adding salespeople to sell the stuff. And then it just blows up and the thing scales like that. That's fantastic. Thank you for, thank thank you for joining us, Andreas. <laughs> and congratulations to the team. All right. Next up, I, I don't know, this is not our first Emba.
but this is our first EMBA this year. And uh, Summer Busto is an EMBA from 2018, the founder and president of Lumen. Hi, everyone. Thank you. It's good to see you. I'm Summer Busto, proud EMBA 18, and the president and founder of Lumen HR Partners. So humans are complex, HR shouldn't be. I founded my company based on the premise that everyone should have access to expert strategic HR advice no matter what stage their company is in. Let's face it, we are facing a workplace revolution right now. A third of the companies are going into co-working spaces and the way we are working is changing. HR needs to evolve with that evolution. Now, I know this slide is a little bit controversial given the audience right now saying that machine learning is not the answer. The point that I wanna stress here is that we are solving uniquely human problems. Although data and algorithms can point to the source and sometimes directly to the problem, we do not yet have the solve to bring forward nuanced solutions. So let's talk through a little bit of stats from the Startup Genome Project. 90% of the companies that they studied failed within their first year of business. 70% of those failures were related to scalability issues, meaning that it was happening prematurely and too quickly. Of the companies that failed, they cited their human capital problems as being one of the main issues of those scalability problems. On the flip side of this, there were companies that did succeed as a part of this project. They were companies that had access to advisors and mentors in the space of human capital. As a result of that, those companies got seven times more funding and they grew 25 times faster. To me, those statistics are fairly compelling. So we see an opportunity. We see an opportunity in this space to change that paradigm and help reduce the number of that 90% failure rate. We see an opportunity to embed ourselves in co-working spaces with accelerators and companies where they're growing to give them the strategic advice so they don't become part of that 90%. As a result of this, I went out to the marketplace and I've piloted this with companies. We already have traction with three organizations and we're seeing very early success in this. We already have a pretty solid revenue stream in just a short period of time, but in order to get to that next step, we need you. We need you all to become luminaries, to connect us with those growing organizations that desperately need our help so we can make a difference. We need you to be a part of our network, to be knowledge advisors, and we need you to come work with us on projects. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. Rashmi, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, could you, um, HR is a wide <laughs> umbrella, right? From recruiting to compliance to everything in between. Could you talk specifically within HR? Maybe it's everything. Uh, about what you guys focus on uh, and the services you provide? Yeah, so far uh, the companies that we've worked with have had three common problems. The first one being attracting talent. It is a very tough marketplace as we know from the person who uh, stood up before me and, and presented. It's also difficult to develop and to keep them in place. And so these are the target areas that we've started working with with the entrepreneurs that we have so far in our system. Uh, my questions were, as you, as you start working with small companies, um, what I've noticed is big companies have a lot of money, right? So they throw free, very valuable resources at the small companies to get them. AWS is a great example. And uh, like, you know, 100,000 in free credits. So with you, uh, when you're trying to target small businesses, but also scale yourselves, and um, so that's one, how do you, how do you monetize that? Um, and then two, uh, what of your that ninety percent um, that you're you know claiming your your tech helps? How does the how did how have you found that your tech helps that right? Uh, what has some results been? 
to prove out that this works. Yep, so um, just a clarification, the 90% was from the Startup Genome Project about failure. Right. So where I've been focusing um, with my team and with the companies that I'm working with is on demand HR. So because they're typically cash strapped, we're either selling service to them by the project or by the hour, or we're doing uh, retainers. And so we are using different models depending on where they are in their growth stage. Okay, so Zenefit, like who would you replace in a current company's workflow? Uh, it, it varies. It okay. can depend on what the exact need of the organization is. So there are lots of services out that are available from a broad-based um, HR perspective, but the difference between us and some of these other organizations like Zenefit is that we actually show up and meet you where you are, so you get a human being. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. All right, Sumner, thank you. For those of you, a lot of you probably didn't have EMBAs around. Um, but it's a great addition to the community here. The people come in and they're, they're here, they're very experienced people. Sloan Fellows are here full time, they're not here full time, they're still in their jobs. But it's a nice new dimension to the program here at Sloan. And thank you, this shows it. And the human in the loop is, there's a new, for those of you who don't know, uh, MIT started a college of computing, um, which is really about taking all this AI, machine learning, natural language processing. And one of the big focuses is, is what you said is, the human in the loop. It's not AI to replace humans, it's AI to complement humans. And we're doing a lot of work with the new College of Computing on this. So the future is humans in the loop, not humans out of the loop. Next, Next up, I'm very interested to hear this one. He is a Sloan Master student from the class of 1994, Ed Gaskin with Sunday Celebrations. Are we ready to celebrate, Ed? Yes, sir. <laughs> So um, I'm Ed Gaskin, the founder of Sunday Celebrations, the next billion dollar brand. Um, our mission is to reduce the incidence of diet related diseases. Uh, and we're gonna do that through our good for you gourmet food products. The uh, chart that you see on, on the left there, you see these um, billion dollar brands, primarily driven by the millennials in the health and wellness segment. And what you also see as part of the good for you gourmet segment, on the right are the 76 million aging baby boomers. Now the reason why we focused on the good for you, meaning no salt, no sugar, no fat, and none of the top eight allergens is because in the standard American diet, we overconsume all of those things. For example, your body only needs about 500 milligrams of sodium. People t don't need any more than 2,300, and people on average consume about 4,000. The same thing as added sugar and fat, it's all the same thing. So we focused on that. So you see the one segment is, is on the prevention side, the other side is on the treatment side. So all those baby, oh, aging baby boomers basically have type two diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and cancer, and that mark is expanding. So they need products with salt, most, less salt, fat, and sugar. Those tend not to taste very well, and that's why we have the gourmet products that we do. Now the bigger problem is that we spend about $3.5 trillion on healthcare in the United States, and as you see it growing as the, age, as the baby boomers age, that most people believe that that's an unsustainable rate and what the impact will have on the economy. So it turns out that one of the largest and easiest ways to reduce healthcare cost is to change diet and food. About 73% of all healthcare dollars are goes to food-related diseases. The problem is that anywhere between 65 and 76% of all food in a grocery store, whether it's Whole Foods, any natural food store, it doesn't matter whether it's organic, not organic, GMO, non-GMO, kosher, all of them have too much salt, too much fat, and too much sugar, which means it's almost impossible without a change of lifestyle to actually get within the tolerable limits. And so we were able to develop these products, as I mentioned, and if you notice, a typical salad dressing might have 170 calories in it with about 140 or 150 of those calories coming from fat. A reduced salad dressing might have 70 calories with about 40 or 50 of those calories coming from that. But we, on our gourmet salad dressing, we have fresh strawberries and champagne, and you'll see that that salad dressing has 25 calories with zero of the calories coming from the fat. 
We were able to do the same thing with high salty foods like a teriyaki sauce. We were able to do the same thing with high sugar things like jelly. So for instance, we can do a maple syrup, which is typically about 85% sugar at 2%. And so we believe the reason why this is the next billion dollar brand is because we can basically reformulate almost anything in the center aisle of the grocery store. It, the brand basically meets all the characteristics of all the other billion dollar brands in both the health and wellness segment and in the food segment. But more importantly, it not only solves the consumer or marketing problem, but it solves the problem for consumer packaged goods companies which are rapidly losing share and they don't have a product like this in their portfolio basically something in the food for medicine space. And we are confident that our technology and our product strategy will work. But beyond this, what's really important is the fact that I'm sure that people here have family and friends who've had to deal with cancer and, and heart disease and heart attacks and strokes and all those disabilitating diseases, and we can do something about that. We can change that. We can make a difference. And so 70% of all the people in the world die because of chronic disease. We can make a difference with our products. So this is how we want to make a difference, and I want you to join with me. Yes, we can. Yes, we yes, can. We can. Right. So, so if I understand you correctly, you've got three or four products that you've built. Uh, we actually did multiple categories. We did products, we did it, um, so what we tried to do in the first early stage was do it by the categories. So examples, I would use an example of syrup, right? So if we could do the most extreme example, something like uh, maple syrup, it's 85% sugar, if we could do that at 2%, then we didn't have to worry about doing it in other, we already proved the technology there. Then the question was, could we do it in something like teriyaki sauce, which is highly, has a high amount of sodium, and, and, and uh, soy is an allergen. So could we do, a, a very low, almost no sodium teriyaki sauce, which we did. We have one outside, raspberry teriyaki. And the point was is that we could do it in numerous categories. So whether it's pasta sauces, jellies, dressings, marinades. But the idea was reformulating the entire center part of the grocery store. The point is, is that they basically you're told to either eat on the perimeter or you're told to make everything from scratch. But today's lifestyle doesn't accommodate that. So therefore, how is it that you then eat healthy if you don't have the time? Uh, wait, 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 Tim. We got to keep moving here. Yeah. Ed, fantastic oh. job. Thank you very <laughs> Sorry. much. Nice job. Sorry, man. Max. No, no problem. Well, we're running behind, yeah. so we're going to have to pick up the pace. Thank you. Bad. Next up, just back from Spain. Mm -hmm. Just back from Spain, Irene Hernandez with Gattaca, also a uh, Delta V graduate. T take it away. Thank you. Yeah. Is this working? Is this working? Can you hear me well? Yes. Good. Well, hello everyone. My name is Irene Hernandez, founder of Gattaca, and I'm here to talk, to talk about how we are reshaping digital identity. Current authentication methods in the internet require digital consumers like you to create one user account with each of the digital services we join. This is not only very, very cumbersome for the end user, it is very risky for companies. They are concentrating so much sensitive information that they're becoming honeypots for hackers. Identity theft costs $45 billion annually, and right that is the problem we're trying to solve. That is why at Gattaca, we're building a new identity layer for the internet. A digital identity everyone trusts. A digital identity that you control. Because we imagine a future where usernames, passwords no longer exist, where your private information is protected and secure, where your identity is in your phone. Let me show you how it works. Our decentralized digital identity framework includes a mobile ID wallet in your phones where users can store identity credentials. Those identity credentials are issued by trusted authority according to an internet standard. Users then use their digital identities to unlock instant access to digital services. So if I want to become a new customer of, say, Bank of America, it's as easy as scanning a QR code, 
verifying which credentials I need to share, and click consent. Our unique technical architecture exploits biometric and blockchain technologies to validate the authenticity and ownership of credentials and to lock consent. And the market is growing exponentially, literally exponentially. From nothing last year, this new industry is expected to grow to $2 billion in less than three years. And there is no clear leader yet. We are the only blockchain agnostic GDPR compliant solution that can adapt to any existing governmental initiative. And the use cases are unlimited. But we are first focused on solving the needs of large financial institutions because they are already testing this concept for its huge potential to save millions in KYC compliance costs. And we had an amazing start. We are already engaged in partnership conversations with large companies and governments. We are closing our seed round as we speak, so expect to hear from us uh, in the next months and the strong steps we're about to make. If you have uh, contacts, key decision makers in the financial industry or in governments, or you want to join our team and make this happen, please come talk to me afterwards. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I think the product market fit is clear and there's a huge TAM out there and you guys are attacking it. And I like that you said that there's no clear winner out there because there are going to be a lot of folks out there, Definitely. right? Um, can you talk a little bit, I think one thing that might help folks here is talk about the revenue model. You're, you're clearly attacking this from the enterprise side. This isn't an individual um, direct-to-consumer play, right? This is after going after... B2B2C, to B to yeah, gotcha. you're right. And can you talk about the, the revenue model, say, with the Bank of America or with a large government? Sure, that's an excellent question. Thank you. So right now, today, uh, large financial institutions and all those industries that need to comply with KYC, Know Your Customer Regulation, what they do is to outsource this activity. So they're hiring third parties to validate the user's information. But they're paying high upfront uh, costs today to validate a user, and that only gets them a snapshot of that user's identity. So they need to perform this validation from time to time or when the user requests a new service. With us, we are charging a very, very low monthly fee for the right to have access to the most updated information of a validated user. Thank you. Thank you. Well done, Irene. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> That's great. All right. Um, all right. Well done, Irene. This is a huge uh, market opportunity, by the way. I know firsthand. And Irene just got back, and she's, she's one year out, and she's gone up and down the life of an entrepreneur. She's living full time. All right. Next up, we have a change in the program. Uh, next up is David of Airworks, who was also in Delta V last year and is MBA 2018. David? Thank you, Bill. Kill him. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Morchenik, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Airworks. Today, I want to talk to you about construction, and more specifically, construction planning. Now, you all, when you walk around campus this weekend, you see the results of it. But it all starts with these gentlemen over here, the civil engineer. The civil engineer is responsible for planning and designing construction projects, for making sure that they're on time and that they're also on cost. Now, how do they do that? They need a lot of information of the existing land they're working on, dimensions, the conditions, and so on. And now we would say cars are driving autonomously on our streets. It should be easy to get that data or just go acquire it really quickly. But the reality is different. In fact, the current state of the art is to take point-by-point -point measurements with an optical instrument on the ground, a technology that almost has not changed much in the last 100 years. Now, as a result, civil engineers have to, work, uh, have to wait about two weeks to even get a quote for those projects, or up to two months to get any kind of data, and then they have to pay costs of up to $50,000. Most of the clients we talk to can't wait so long. So they have to find creative solutions. They go to the town halls, they get old survey drawings in paper format, scan them, import them in their uh, engineering systems and redraw the lines. That's not only cumbersome, but that's also very risky and prone for error. 
but that's how it's done in 2019. Now, we have a different strategy. We want to solve this problem in the $7.7 .7 billion surveying market and help engineers get better data at higher speeds. We have built a technology that uses machine learning and computer vision to automatically analyze aerial data from drones, aircrafts, and satellites and convert that fully autonomously into engineering site plans. Now, the drawing you see here on the, uh, on the top right can be created by an engineer in about 40 hours. Our technology creates the same drawing in only 30 minutes. That, <laughs> that not only helps the engineer to have better data right from the start, but he can save up to two months during the site planning projects. And also, he can design projects that actually stay on time and at cost. Now, in the past, we've already worked with over 20 clients here in New England to validate the market needs for this technology. And we've done most of these projects uh, manually. But that also helped us to get a huge training data set that we have used in the past two years to finish the development of our, of our autonomous aerial data processing software. And we're really excited that this software is now finalized and we're launching later this summer. Now, we believe that it should be as easy as ordering an Uber ride to get engineering site plans. And we believe by automating this process step by step, we can get there. Now, if you're a civil engineer, a land developer, and interested in beta testing or partnering with us, come talk to me after, afterwards. We're also looking for another full stack developer to join our team um, and a marketing intern for the summer. Um, thank you. Hey, David, great work, man. Uh, I've seen those guys. And I remember in high school, this was a big career, surveying. So that was pretty cool. Uh, my question is, uh, currently, like, what kind of resolution do you have? So what are you replacing? And then uh, as you get further, you know, I, I assume there's liabilities associated with getting these measurements wrong. So how do you make sure your measurements are right? And uh, what are those liabilities for people who don't know? Sure, absolutely. So resolution, I want to answer your resolution question first. Um, that's why we mostly use UAV data. Um, people have been using satellites and GIS information to kind of supplement their work since a long time. Those scenarios get to about 30 centimeters per pixel. UAV data gets to about a centimeter per pixel, so much, much better, and really it's survey grade accuracies. In terms of the liability, that's a great question. Um, we provide the software. Um, we can only be as good as the models that go into the software. So if the images are captured in the wrong way, that's really um, the client that's responsible. So that's why um, most of the models are used only for, well, that's why we like to sell to people that know how to acquire good data, and also why we are starting with initial design, because there really you have not many liabilities um, in terms of the, the, the stamping process. Well done, David. <laughs> nice job. Let's just give that to Shana, all right? Uh, and by the way, uh, seeing these companies go, you know, entrepreneurship, for those of you who have never done it, it's, as we talk about, it's going through the jungle. It's so hard. And uh, seeing these people now, it seems obvious what they're doing. Oh, it's easy. You go from 40 hours to 30 minutes. But David was laboring, you know, <laughs> drawing all these customers and trying to figure out who the right end user was and who was the economic buyer and who was the champion. And it's great to see you've uh, found the way now. It's really... All right, next up is another Delta V1 from 2018 as well, MBA, Shana Opperman with Pluto. Everyone wants to feel that people care about them. And everyone wants to show care to the people in their life. Building relationships comes down to being more thoughtful about the things that matter to others. The problem is, being thoughtful about anything today is hard. Given the rush of daily life, your competing priorities as an adult, people are moving more. And ironically, for all the links, likes, and followers, we are more connected than ever. But we have never felt more apart. It's the little things that sustain true connection and make for our happiness. As simple as remembering to ask about a friend's job hunt or recent trip. And in our overextended world, it's these little things that get deprioritized the most. So we founded Pluto. Pluto's mission is to revive true human connection. It's a companion to help you follow through on your intentions and create shared moments of joy with the people that you care about. 
For our starting point, you just text Pluto like you would a friend, and it offers reminders timed to fit your lifestyle and recommendations tailored to your unique relationships. So an example I like to give is if you're friends with me, it might suggest you text me good luck before this pitch with a goofy 80s song and remind you to do it while you're brushing your teeth in the morning versus in the rush of a meeting. There is nothing to download. It's all based on natural language processing. And did you know that 72% of Americans use text messaging to maintain their personal relationships? So it only makes sense that Pluto is all text-based to start with no access to give. And it doesn't just personalize to you, but you in context with others. You are different with your spouse and with your coworker than with your best friend. Understanding the complexity of human dynamics from minimal user input sounds hard to do because it is. But this is what makes Pluto a humane AI that people can trust. To get here, we did nine months of research while we were at MIT, spoke with thousands of people from across the country, and did multiple prototypes. And when we focused on our target market, our wait list went from 400 to 10,000 in two months. And of our early beta testers, we're seeing 60% retention week on week. We're a consumer subscription model. We just did uh, Techstars Boston, but we're also a proud Delta V alum. Uh, we've raised funds, and we're closing our pre-seed at the end of this month. Let me tell you about the team. We're MIT grads, like all of you. We're former Googlers, and we have 20 years of software and machine learning startup experience. We've built consumer software used by over a million people, produced award-winning marketing campaigns for Nike, Coke, Burberry, General Mills, and our lead engineer built the lauded NLP system for WordStream. And we each have a deep personal story driving why we're doing this. Mine stems from when I was 14 and spent a year in and out of a wheelchair. I formed a deep interest in memory, loneliness, and social connection that has impacted all that I do in my life. Remembering and acting on the little things are what stitch the fabric of our relationships and of our lives. Everyone, right now, think of somebody that you care about. Could you do a better job at showing them that you do? Maybe somebody from your class? <laughs> if yes, then don't leave this reunion without talking to me. I'm Shana. We're Pluto. Let's choose to stay in orbit with our friends and family, and let's make the world show care again. Thank you. All right. Is this you, Rashmi? Yeah, I'll take it. All right. Awesome. I love it. Um, um, what has been, you talked about a 10,000 person, uh, you say 10,000 people on the? Over 10,000. Over 10,000 people yep. on, the, on the waiting list. Okay, awesome. So what has been, what do you see as kind of the biggest uh, hurdle that you guys are going to have around adoption for this? It totally makes sense. There, but there's other calendar apps, there's other reminders. Yeah. So yeah. what's the biggest hurdle for to you? To me, the biggest hurdle is just de-risking the product. So being able to continuously get feedback and act on it quickly and then continue staying on top of it. That's to me the biggest thing we're focused on. All of our fundraising is going towards product. Gotcha. Okay. Cool. What's your engagement been? Sorry, Bill. Come on, man. I had to ask. <laughs> What's your engagement been like for the people that use it? Uh, uh, five times a week with a 50% organic usage growth, which means without us prompting them, they'll come back the next week and double their engagement. Nice job. Thanks. Wow. Well done, Shana. <laughs> Do you mind just giving it to Dana? So, I, uh, you know, isolation was identified by the Surgeon General as the number one health threat. I don't know if you know this, more than cigarettes or anything else, to people in the United States today. And it's so great to see our students uh, taking aim at this problem and using technology to solve it, whereas technology has increased isolation. And again, to see this, to see where Shane had just wanted to solve this problem in the beginning and to see the tenacity at which now this is a well-formed idea and a real company, and it's just so great. Next up, with another real problem, Dan Stern, class MBA, class of 2018. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dan Stern, CEO at Alba. And at Alba, we provide instant and trusted caregivers for families in Latin America. Right now, we're generating 250K in annual recurring revenue, and we have over 2,000 paying clients. All this while growing 22% month over month for the past six months. So at Alba, we exist for people like my co-founder, Tessie. Tessie had to quit her job because she couldn't find a reliable caregiver to take care of her two kids. And Tessie's not alone in Latin America. There's over 30 million families in Latin America that cannot find a caregiver every single month. And this creates a huge market opportunity of over $30 billion 
when we account for all home care services, which are pet care, third age care, and babysitting. At Alba, we are currently focusing on babysitting, which is a $6 billion market. And in this market, there are over 10,000 babysitting agencies, which are basically moms and pop shops that are not reliable, they're not trustworthy. So at Alba, we decided to do something slightly different. And we want to ensure peace of mind in the entire care process. So when families search for a babysitter at Alba, we provide them with their perfect babysitter, just as if their best friend would have recommended it by using, of course, AI, it's MIT, and social network information. When the babysitter is working, we provide live updates of what's happening at home. Videos, images, text. On top of that, we have 24-7 support from our team for the babysitter and for the family. Finally, you can rehire with just one click um, and pay with credit cards to have a true seamless experience. So we know it's working, and why do we know it's working? So once again, we have over 2,000 paying customers. We have over 92% retention rate of our customers, um, which makes us a truly valuable solution for the families. I couldn't have done this by myself. Um, we are over 12 people in my team, but my co-founders make the most of it. Tessie, my COO, uh, she has extensive experience in child education. She has run over three companies in Europe and in Latin America. And Mauricio, the mastermind behind my product, um, he used to work for the Chilean FBI, chasing the bad guys, uh, not the good guys. Um, and he has over five years of experience running tech companies. Um, and I'm the CEO, this is my third startup. I'm an MBA of 2018. Um, I'm proud Dela TV alum. Um, we closed our seed round a few months ago, but our next step is opening Mexico. We plan to open Mexico, we only operate in Chile right now, in the next four months. So if you have a connection in Mexico that you can share ideas, thoughts, or even money, why not, um, come on, talk to me. Thanks. I'll take this. Hey, Dan, so I know that uh, you've been working on this a while. What was the uh, the the aha moment that started making the growth happen, right? So what was the, the key there? It was Bill. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> um, um, actually, it was good around... Answer, good answer. It was Not around true, Delta V. So when you think about care, families think about trust. Um, and it's all about having that peace of mind. Like, hiring out the babysitter only by itself is not what truly makes you feel like, oh, I'm just okay living my kid with someone I don't know. So it's like, how do you create an entire process of like making sure the family is okay. And when we learned that, and we provided a product that was able to actually solve the, the peace of mind part, we started retaining them and growing. And it was actually at Delta V that we made a difference. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Dan. And by the way, you know, one of the things I've learned, you know, at the Trust Center after 10 years is when someone comes in, there's never a bad idea. You know, and, and when, like, was, was, um, was having a new web uh, search engine a good idea? Well, it turned out it, it wasn't. It didn't sound like it, but it was. Um, was Facebook a good idea when you had MySpace and Friendster? Was, so we see it. I remember the first time Dan came in, and I, I, and, I, and I didn't say this to Dan. I was like, I don't know. I've heard this idea plenty of times. But it so much depends on the team. And he didn't get into his personal story, just, just like you heard with some of these other people. We always talk. The company has to have a strong raison d'etre. Uh, raison d'etre is Spanish. It means reason for existence. <laughs> and and um, that was a joke, Irene. I know it's not Spanish. <laughs> but, uh, but I think on each of these teams, when you think, when, when you see, go to the, when you go to the slide about the team, and all those people, they've been tested. It's like the, like for Shane, it's like the third or fourth time. For each of these people, you gotta find the right team. The team is so important. It goes back to that really important class. And uh, for, for Dan, I know the, the other people he put up there, he knew for a long time. And when he had this, it's like, this is a really hard problem. You know, care.com's been going out. And he's like, here's, here's the things that we've got going. So. Next up is Paul. I don't know anything about his company, so I'm gonna be really, really interested to hear this. <laughs> Kill him, Paul. Hello. Okay. Hi, I'm Paul Sudapong, uh, MBA 2009, E&I, all right. 
So today I'm going to be talking to you about retail industry, uh, digital, digital disruption in retail industry, making uh, resulting in the struggle of retailers and offline store. Getting new customer and loyal, and loyal customer for them is getting more and more difficult. Okay, so one of our proven method of getting a new customer is to cross promote with each other. So all of these retailers have their own membership system. They're basically sitting on a gold mine. They know a lot about their own individual customer. So by utilizing each other knowledge about each individual customer, they can cross promote with each other and actually effectively making cross promotion a very low cost targeted uh, marketing tools. However, cross promotion require a really lengthy negotiation, one-on-one -on -one negotiation process. This is due to the fact that each retailer have their own different customer data and the way that they communicate with their own customer, they are never the same. And this slow manual process uh, usually prohibit uh, a lot of, most of the cross-promotion opportunity. Uh, so introducing Primo. So Primo is an online data-driven platform. So we enable an effective many-to-many -many, uh, cross-promotion matching together with the flexible promotion uh, delivering and tracking technology that we have, we enable cross promotion to be as easy and cost effective as it should be. So we are a team of uh, Sloan MBA 2009. So our co-founder is Sloan MBA 2009. And we are expert in, in the field of data analytics, uh, consumer data analytics, retail technology. I've been doing retail technologies for the last 10 years since I left Sloan and MFX, and also uh, corporate digital innovation. So uh, we have signed with the one, which is the largest membership program in Thailand. They have more than 15 million members. And that, together with other clients, uh, really accelerate us with a fantastic traction. Currently, we process about almost 2 million promotion per month. Uh, this is a 15 uh, time growth for the last 10 months. Uh, that resulting in a 5x growth in revenue uh, over the same period of time. Uh, we have early investors. We are funded by SOSV. Uh, and also, we get some grant from government of Thailand as well. We're currently raising a $1 million uh, seed round. And we are also looking to expand outside Thailand. So if you're interested in uh, investment or partnership, uh, come talk to me. Did rush me? I got a question. <laughs> yeah, can you talk about, I mean, just tactically, what is the um, benefit to the one, that program that you're working, what, what have they seen as improvements? And maybe just give some specific examples so people can really understand what the platform does. So uh, the one is the largest membership in Thailand, so they part of the central group, which is the largest conglomerate in retail in Thailand. So they have from uh, grocery store to shopping malls to brands to thing that's similar to Power Buy here or Sport Mall here. So they, they're sitting on this gold mine of data of, of uh, what consumer shopping behavior is. So for them to actually expose that data and go talk to each of the brand or the retailer to get a better promotion or targeted promotion for each of them, 50 million customer is very hard. So we actually enable that. We also enable this way uh, targeted delivery mechanism um, to for them to actually customize each of the offering to each of their uh, members, as a matter of fact. So, so they send a bunch of SMS, like uh, 100,000 of SMS uh, in a week, for example. Uh, each of SMS is uh, embedded with our mini uh, kind of a promotion page, and all these 100,000 person would actually receive different promotion based on their interest. That's 
much. And who's the who's the key buyer within the organization that you guys need to get connected to? Uh, for for the one uh, um, or any any perspective. Um, for so so we so we B two B. So for the people who have members, so we usually talk to the CIM. So they are usually a CIM department or people who actually own a member. And then for a retailer is, is who are the marketers. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Paul. Well done. Thank you. Let's give this to. The 2009 was a pretty prolific class, huh? <laughs> um, we only get... So, uh, so I just say the, our last pre presenter here, he was part of the New York Startup Studio as well, and Yishi is going to talk about Deep Edge, but it's so appropriate because when he first showed up at Sloan, I think it was like within the first week he was there, he was in my office saying, we got this company called Deep Edge, and it's amazing. He stayed with it the whole time and here through graduation. So, Ishii, take Thanks, it Bill. away. It's been a while. It's been quite the journey. Excited to uh, see some familiar faces and excited to share my, our story with you guys. So, Deep Bench, what we do is we efficiently connect those who have questions with those who have answers. And this is the problem that we're solving. Seeking external advice is expensive for enterprises, but accessing internal expertise is also complicated. There's a lot of smart people in this room right now and watching outside. Every single one of you has a ton of extremely valuable knowledge and insights in your heads from your accumulated decades of life experience and work experience. It's really, really valuable stuff. But if you think about it, a lot of that knowledge is actually trapped in your head. After all, unless someone talks to you or asks you a question, that knowledge is, remains in your head. And what Deep Bench does is we're indexing the knowledge that's in your head and we're, we're unlocking it so that more people can access it. We're indexing knowledge that not even Google has access to. And this is a problem that every single enterprise faces, whether you have 500 people, 5,000 people, or 50,000 people. This is our team. We actually met at MIT. We met in Bill Allett's entrepreneurship classes. I'm the CEO, and two of my co-founders are maybe in this room right now, somewhere around Reunion. Uh, Derek Hans, our CTO, class of 2018. Devin ba Bassinger, MBA 2018 as well. And Nico Pumwani, uh, undergrad, master's, computer science, MIT. We all met and in entrepreneurship classes at MIT. And while we were in school, we started building the platform, started selling the product, and generated over $100,000 of revenue while full-time students. We actually graduated last year, and late last year, during the summer, enterprises started approaching us that didn't just want to, license, didn't just want to use our services to find expert knowledge on demand, but they actually wanted to license our software. And the first enterprise customer that approached us eventually just agreed to sign a $150,000 annual contract. They were actually so excited that they actually made a strategic investment in us for $300,000. And to date, we're at a roughly a $500,000 run, run rate. We raised a little more than half a million dollars. And we're not looking for that much more capital. We're just about to close another angel round. So if people are uh, in the audience today are interested. We have room, a little more room for more angels. But what we're really looking for is more introductions to enterprises that many of you have experienced. A lot of smart people in enterprise, but it's very hard to identify who knows what and connect those who have questions with those who have answers. So if you're interested, please come find me, ishi at deepbench.io, and join us on our mission to become the go-to information platform for all knowledge workers. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. Thanks. Hey, uh, great presentation. Uh, quick question is, and I might have missed this, is are these companies that you're, you're now targeting trying to use this internally, like large, large companies, you know, like, like Microsoft to share within, or are they trying to now monetize their people even further by, uh, you know? That, that's a terrific it? question. So the short answer is both. We actually have two separate software products. One is called Showcase, where we connect internal employees to their customers so that companies can generate more revenue and b build better relationships with their, with their customers. We also have a product called Discover, where it's internal to internal, and that's also a huge opportunity as well. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, man. Nice job. Congratulations on the order, man. That's fantastic. So, uh, great finale. I mean, uh, you see how we, we, we don't talk about the conceptual, we talk about getting real orders. And um, well done, Yishi. 
And then I, I think nothing could be better than that. Here we took someone who was working at Goldman Sachs and made them a productive member of society. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're about. <laughs> She's heard that shot many times, so. Uh, <laughs> so look, um, before we wrap up, um, I just want to give a shout out to some, I, I looked around and, I, and this is something I probably definitely should not do and Kathy would tell me don't do it. But I want to give a shout out to some of the people here who have been entrepreneurs in, in, in the past and, and welcome you back, Oliver Stahl. Where are Oliver? He's been Energy Ventures, that went, went back and started a company and made a big difference in the energy efficiency area, sold it and uh, we're expecting a big building soon for the Trust Center. Um, <laughs> that was a joke. L latter part was a joke. Sloan Fellow, 2009. Sloan Fellow, 2009. Best class ever. Yay. Alad, Alad was here. Is Alad still here? Alad Shoshan left. All right. He, he, uh, he started his company here. Um, what did he change the name to? Ready Four. Ready Four. Yeah. And he recently exited that. Uh, we have Miles Wellesley back there. <laughs> Stand up, Miles. He was, what was it, Eddie, Crazy Eddie? What was the name of your company? Local Eddie. Local Eddie. <laughs> he worked on this company day and night, like as hard as all these people did. And I say that there's no bad ideas. This was a bad idea. <laughs> was it? We're still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what Miles has done now, he has joined Robin Hood as the first business person. And this is what we see more and more, is like he, they didn't have a job description. They didn't go out in my monster and said, we're looking for a business person. He just knew him and kind of said, hey, you know, can I help you? And he basically wrote his own job description. He's the first, person, first business person at Robin Hood. And if those of you who don't know Robin Hood, you should. Uh, they're, they're headed towards an IPO. And uh, it's a great, great story. Um, Jeremy Kirsch, is Jeremy here? I saw Jeremy earlier today. So I've left out a bunch of other people, Kevin Burke, my, I, I, I'm not gonna go all the way around the room because I'll blow it. But first of all, uh, let, me, let me thank the judges. Uh, that's what I do, Dip, nice, that's nice, what I do. Dip, and, Dip and Rashmi, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry about the Eagles this year. Rashmi, thank you very much. Carson's back. You guys represented a class very well. And, and for, for all the entrepreneurs here, I hopefully you all are proud. You know, obviously, I'm incredibly proud. Not only do they do a good job, but they take on real hard problems. I mean, when you look at what there's, there's no, there's no fear in what Irene's doing, you know, going after digital identity, going up against some of the biggest companies in the world. And, you know, uh, Aline, getting TEF, we didn't even talk about how hard it is to get TEF out of Africa. And, and Quentin, taking on the insurance industry. Wow, uh, you need some, you, you ought to get on Pluto and get some help here. Uh, <laughs> and mental health, it's just, it's, it's just so, we're so incredibly proud of you guys. And thank you for stepping up today and, and, uh, and doing this. I know some of you, like Andreas, you know, this was really, you're giving back to the community. There's, there was a tremendous amount for you to gain here, but thank you very much. And most of all, thank you all for coming out. Um, entrepreneurship, is a community thing. We always talk about, you, to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to have the heart to be an entrepreneur. You have to be willing to be different. You have to have the head, know what to do. You have to have the hands to be able to do it. But the last H, the fourth H, is a home having a supportive community and having people that will work with you through the ups and the downs emotionally, but then also help you to get connections, to get to investors, to get customers, to get new employees. That's the community. Because, um, you know, Bill Salman defined entrepreneurship as the pursuit of opportunities with resources beyond your control. And so it's very, what we teach our students is how do you get, build communities, effective communities where you give to that community but you get back. Because as the law of the jungle said, the strength of the pack is in the wolf. All the entrepreneurs themselves have to be strong. We train strong individual entrepreneurs. But the strength of the wolf is in the pack. When you take a whole bunch of strong entrepreneurs, when you put them in a community like MIT Sloan, they can conquer the world. They can take down Microsoft. They can take down Google. They can take down Goldman Sachs. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Open house is right outside. If you want anything to know about, I'm not gonna give you an ad about uh, the Trust Center. Just go to entrepreneurship.mit.edu or see me afterwards. We have some annual reports. We'll send them to you. But everyone will be out there, all the teams. Can you guys sneak out first? So you're manning your tables when they get out there? A big hand for them.